whole um, essay or rhetoric built ethos because it was just telling parts of her life story and who she was. And through that, she was revealing to us um, the, what, what literacy meant to her. And so through all of her little experiences, we got to know her a little better and we trusted her a little more. Yeah, you're so right, Anna. Her transparency, her honesty. I mean, like she's really, I, I, she's, she is vulnerable with people that she doesn't know very well. And her honesty um, makes her seem trustworthy. Um, what, I, you know, like we talk about pathos, what are some emotions you experienced as you were reading? Again, anybody. Um, when I started reading this, I was just like caught really off guard, to be honest. Like I just like started reading this article and I was like, whoa, like this is really dark, like really quickly. And like, it's really descriptive of like everything that happened. So like that makes like the reader feel like they're like kind of like seeing their own version of it themselves. Yeah, um, you know, like that surprise, that shock, that, yeah, that surprise and shock. Other emotions you read or places you experienced the surprise and shock. Somebody else? I had one passage about um, when she mentions her mom's story with the boyfriend. And I wrote down some emotions of just like dread and horror from it. And then kind of like a fear reading it, like expecting something like that. Like you hear about some other stories like this all the time. And then like from that demographic, you kind of like expect something like that to happen to you. Uh, yeah. Um, one of the reasons why I hesitated to assign this um, text is because I didn't want to trigger um, memories in students that might have um, might have seen um, domestic violence or other kinds of violence and trigger those memories. Um, and yet, what I learned in assigning it is that students who had experienced these kinds of things in their lives they were less shocked than i was but they felt validated and included and they it the the reading resonated with them in ways that it didn't resonate with me um i'm sort of her primary audience um quite honestly i i mean like i teach writing um I look like almost every other writing teacher you have ever had. So um, I know, strangely enough, which is problematic in and of itself. Let me, um, I, so here's our plan for the day. Um, I want to discuss Lin Thor, and I want to do it. I told you I was experimenting, and we'll see how it works. Um, I've got some questions that I have, and I'm going to put you into breakout rooms. And I'm just going to let you um, do one question at a time with one other person. And then when we come back, we'll talk about it as a group. Um, oh, and then it says identify underlying assumptions in Koenig and uh, rhetorical strategies in Koenig. That's not you, that's another class. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, there we go. So here are the three questions that I'm going to ask you to answer. Which passage resonates with you the most? Which passage reveals um, Linfor's identity most to you? And which passage is most useful for understanding Linfor's main point or her purpose? And I want to remind you, you are not her primary audience because she's writing to teachers who teach literacy 
and she assumes some things about them. So you're reading it as a secondary audience, an audience that um, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with her about this, and she assumed other people than her primary audience would read this. And so she wrote it for that audience too, just not primarily for that audience. So as I'm talking, I hope that you are choosing a passage that resonated with you most, a passage that speaks to you about who Linfor is the most? Because remember, her identity, her honesty, you know, like we feel like we know her. So what's that passage that shows you who she is the most? And um, which passage is most useful for understanding her main point or purpose, okay? So let us escape the slides and I'm going to put you into um, breakout rooms and you're gonna have you know, like obviously introduce each other uh, yourselves just very very briefly and um introduce yourselves very very briefly and then answer the first question and i'll send you that first question in case you i you know, like it's which what passage resonated with you most so um 13 rooms create rooms, and you get about two minutes to do this. So it's super fast. Just answering the first question you said? Just the first question. question on Anna, you still there? Uh, yeah. Because if you don't join the breakout room, Kristen will be all by herself. No, it, my Wi-Fi or something just cut out, and it um, like so I like didn't hear any of the talk, talking, oh, okay. and then I didn't the join. The breakout room okay, no up, worries. So. Okay, go ahead and join Anna, and then or, or you're Anna, Kristen, and then um, <laughs> I know internet is crazy, so go ahead and join her. There's. There's not a button for me anymore oh. to join. Um, so breakout room. Um, uh, let me see if I can move you to breakout room. Ooh. Okay, I'm gonna move you to breakout room five. And okay. I'm gonna move Kristen to breakout room one. There we go. Got that? No, I still don't have like a join breakout room button. Oh, move to. Hmm. Oh, okay, I found it. I okay, got it. Good. Is good, this join breakout room three? Yeah. Okay. So almost everybody is back. Um, I'm not gonna call on groups like I would, but I, um, I'm i gonna just ask the question. So what are some of the things that 
um, you've shared with somebody else. Now, uh, two or three of you, which passages resonated with you the most and why? Uh, for me, it was, uh, you want me to find the exact passage or is it okay if I describe it? it it's okay if you describe it, it but referencing it is always yeah. better, but it's fine I believe it was around like right after Lynn Flora was talking about how she would see the anchorman talk about the hillside strangler and her mother telling her the stories about how she was like the domestic abuse and everything. And it was just like, wow, this is, this is crazy, right? Like you're telling this just like such a young girl at the time. And I was just thinking like, I would like never, I could like not conceive of like, I sat down with my parents and they're like, yeah, this, 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 I'd be like kind of too much to think about. And then immediately afterwards, Lynn Ford walks to school alone when she was five during like this time of like a serial killer is like on the loose. And I was like, this is just crazy. Uh, yeah, now she was a little older walking to school, um, but it's not easy to see that. And she lived in Riverside and the, the serial killer was in LA, mm -hmm. but in Riverside you would often get LA channels. Um, but yeah, I, I was like, so for me, for my life, I was so shocked. I go, how irresponsible of her mom to, sh I mean, this was my emotional response. Um, but she gives a reason why her mother and grandmother share with her on um, these terrible things. Uh, do any of you remember what sh reason she gave? To let her know women aren't weak. Yeah, to let her know that women aren't weak. Um, also on, um, on page five, she says, my grandmother knew as my mother did that the odds were against me. I was poor and I was a girl. Um, I was disabled. I was exposed. They knew I could be and would be attacked. But probably by not by men. I mean, like, it's like, it's like, this is their life. And so they're, you know, like, it's sort of like warning her. It's, um, yeah, Tuan, I was with you. It's like, how could that happen? So other passages that resonated with you? Um, our group really, really liked the passage about the grandmother when the grandmother was telling um, Lynn for like her story and about her life. And she was talking about death, but then, and it's a really like dark passage, but at the very end, like the last sentence is, and she lived and lived joyously. Um, we all thought that was pretty inspiring that despite everything that she'd been through, she continued to live her own life. Yeah, I, I mean, like that is, it's this, this, this essay goes to some really dark places and yet it's, very joyous. Um, something can be one thing and the opposite almost simultaneously. Um, one other passage that resonated with you. Um, well, for me, it was on like, um, chat, uh, like page six when it was talking about how she went to the like downtown library like every Thursday afternoon when the library was quiet and empty and she would like find books about murder mysteries and like like just plain survival and like that resonated within me because like it showed the intellectual curio curiosity within her and like uh, when I was younger I always have like curiosity about like murder mysteries as well or like any anything that actually like interested me and I'd, I would always like try to pursue that curiosity and like try to find videos and books about it and like find anything so I can learn about it and yeah that really just that curiosity just piqued my interest. Yeah you'll know it, she's constantly in this she's just constantly trying to learn 
everything about everything that could possibly help her survive. Um, yeah, and that that's with her this day. She owns a couple of um, turtles and she had to bring them in because her house was being fumigated and so they were in the office. And she would just tell me all the things about those turtles. It was what they eat, how they mate, how often they mate. Yeah, it was, I learned a lot about, don't ask me, I don't remember anything, but Callie still does remember. Okay, I'm putting you into breakout rooms with um, new people. Okay, so um, your question is, you know, like, what tells you the most, of, what passage tells you the most about her identity? Okay, so you get about two minutes. Okay, which passage tells you the most about who she is? Somebody new. Um, Mari? Okay, um, so I was talking about the passage where her and her mother are talking and she's older at that point and um, her mom is dying and she has cancer. And so to me, that was really powerful because considering everything that her mom had been through and lived through, and at that point in her life that um, Callie is trying to cook for her and talk to her about like good things, about learning and storytelling and stuff, it kind of shows who she is as a person because um, no matter what, is going on or what they've been through, like they're still gonna look at the bright side and make the most out of every situation. Yeah, I, it tell, I, yeah, it shows you a lot about her. And again, that identity revelation makes you trust her more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, Sulema. So we're talking about the, um, passage where it says my mother sat heels on the coffee table studying listening yet close enough like we were talking how that one just kind of um expresses like her everyday things like her life in a way how like that was what most like spoke about her directly yeah yeah i i, I know that that memory of her mom and and what her life was like um drea um, my group talked about uh, this last part in like the bottom of page eight. It was like everything I've just told you. I remember why I teach, why I share anything extra I know. And all the pages before that just kind of had like a sense of what kind of person she was. Yeah. I, I mean, who she is comes through um, in extraordinary ways that anything extra. Um, some of you, you collect extra things, things you want to, you know, like just random information. Um, okay, last question is, um, which passage speaks to you most about um, Callie's main point or her purpose? Okay, once again, I'm gonna put you in brand new groups um, and you'll get about two minutes to share. Jordan, are you there?
The other people will be back shortly. Okay, so a passage that speaks about her purpose or her main point. Carlos? Uh, for me, I'd say in, um, around page five, when she explained um, how she was going through a disability and how before that, it wasn't that person I was explaining more on the aspects of her grandma and her mother and what was going around in her area. But after that, it started showing more personal details about her life after she described what she was going through at such a young age and how even her mother and grandma knew that she was she was uh, at a disability, at disadvantage at such her life. Okay, so what do you think her main point of writing this is? I'd say it'd be to spread more awareness to other people and what they've gone through in the past rather than just what you meet at the front. I definitely think that she is trying to communicate that awareness to this audience of English teachers and that, you know, like that need to be aware that every person comes from a different background, but I think that's a piece of it. Why does she think it's so important? Somebody else, because um, I think that's absolutely essential and I like that you point that out, Carlos. Um, why is it so important that this audience of English teachers who look like me in large part, I mean, this was written in 2000 through 2002, so it's 20 years ago. Why does she say that these writing teachers need to be aware? What speaks to that purpose, that reason? Amaru? Well, I thought a lot of like what she's saying about her purpose was like nicely concluded in her last paragraphs because she goes on to kind of explain that well why she writes that these experiences kind of influenced her writing what she felt like was important what she wanted to know about but then also she talks about how like literacy is like a tool it's a tool of survival and i think that's important for teachers to understand that it's not just maybe about like good writing i think for me like when i think of literacy it's just kind of be able to like comprehend writing or kind of a basic understanding of it and i think she's pushing them more to understand that people, it connects people in different ways and that they can use it to their own advantage and it can be helpful and you know benefit you. Yeah, I, I think, um, can somebody point to a specific sentence that speaks to that concept? Um, in the last paragraph, it literally just says, literacy is survival, I mean that literally. Um, and then I, yeah, I just think her entire last paragraph is just kind of summing up the importance of literacy that we limit it to the classroom and we kind of associate it with reading and writing and annotating, but it's, we don't associate it enough with like understanding and knowledge. Um, cause we use literacy in our everyday lives. Like we're, we read things every day and we see signs, um, books, so I feel like it just like penetrates every aspect of our lives and that it would be unwise to confine it to the classroom or to a classroom setting. Yeah, um, she says, um, yeah, it's like literacy, this learning, this learning to read different situations in different contexts, in different ways, it doesn't only happen in a classroom. And so we see her acquiring literacy in a variety of places. Um, she illustrates how she acquires literacy through storytelling, through tragedy, 
through the news, through television, um, from a variety of people, the librarian at school and the library, from her mother, from her grandmother, um, from her family members. She also says, she says limiting, um, she says, Literacy is a multi-source and vibrant survival tool. Um, we have to respect all the literacies. And um, what literacies do we, does she, I mean, this is where it goes back to, sorry, I'm rambling, I feel like. Uh, this goes back to what Carlos was saying, um, that everybody comes from a different background that teachers need to be aware that everybody acquires literacies differently. They have different backgrounds. They walk into a classroom with different literacies. And they need to celebrate that, value that, respect it. And I think she's assuming a few things about her audience. And I wanna come back down to this because I think it's super important that we remember, we remember that she's not really only talking to you. So let me come back to here. Um, she is looking, um, this slide doesn't work as well. Uh, so let me just pause here and come back here. What is she assuming that her audience believes about literacy? Um, one of the assumptions that I noticed was that um, she mentions how she failed all of her writing classes in high school and like before she got to higher education. And I think she thinks the teachers assume that's how they judge if she's a good writer and she seemed like, oh, if you're failing classes, you wouldn't be good at it. Like that's how you judge their skill level. Yes, I think, I think that and I think back to Carlos's idea is that um, a lot of times um, teachers will judge people on, you know, like the grade that they got, not recognizing that they have other literacies, that they have other experiences, that they might have reasons why they got that bad grade, but they're still capable of learning. And so she's really cautioning by telling her own story, she's cautioning students. Her purpose is to say, value all the literacies, value all the experiences, and remember, you know, like, and in doing that, remember that people come from different backgrounds. Um, so she's assuming that they judge a student's effort by their grades. And um, by the way, um, Callie Linfor has dyslexia. And so she didn't learn to read for a really long time. Something that students, you know, like teachers were less aware of in 2002 and more aware of now. And so she got judged a lot. Um, is there anything else she would assume of her audience of teachers, writing teachers? I think uh, an assumption that she might make is that uh, just based upon the target audience for this being teachers, I think she might assume that teachers believe that what they teach is majoritively right and that their way is a good way to teach because they've learned um, that specific idea. And of course, they're adept in it and they want to teach it. But I think she might want to bring light to the fact that there's other ways to say what they want to say and that people can learn it differently. Yeah, definitely, I see that, Derek. Um, in fact, she is challenging her audience to think and teach in new ways. And so it's super important that she establish her credibility. And I think one of you pointed out that she, you know, like that line, right where she challenges her audience, she says, everything I've told you I remember why I teach. And she wants to emphasize, I'm a teacher too. 
I am that person you might have dismissed. Um, is there anything else she assumes about her audience that they think or that they value? Okay. Um, I, yeah. Oh, sorry. I think that she assumes that like people who are reading this might not be able to relate. Sorry, my dog is scratching, but um, that they have a lot of privilege that they come from. And so she's trying to like break down those barriers and make them recognize and kind of put it in their face. Like, like some, you don't, we don't all have these privileges that some of you may have. Um, I think that you, I think that that's a really profound observation, Mari. And I actually kind of hinted at it. I'm her primary audience. I was super shocked. I'm like, how can a mom do that? And my experience is super privileged, uh, middle-class upbringing. Um, my parents went to college. All four of my grandparents went to college. And we're talking, you know, like that means that my grandmothers were going to college in a time when um, women didn't go to college, generally speaking. And so they all went, I mean, so, so you can see where I'm coming from. And I'm not unusual when it comes to teachers. And so she is definitely um, speaking to people who have some privilege, who would have been shocked, who might have dismissed students who struggled, who had disabilities, um, or who were poor, whose poverty, whose, um, whose poverty kept them from achieving at the level of some other students of privilege. And she really wants every teacher to value all the literacies, all the ways of learning, all the ways of being in the world. And so, and I love how you all narrowed this down. You looked at from different aspects in her storytelling in order to get to that. And we only have five minutes left. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to the share screen. Um, and I'm going to skip over a few things. Um, I talked about underlying assumptions on Canvas. I talk about rhetorical strategies on Canvas. And anything that I would have said in this lecture, I've probably said much better on Canvas. Canvas is, you know, like every time I have a Canvas page, it's like I've assigned you a textbook, only it's a textbook that I wrote. Yeah, that takes a lot of time. Um, not, I don't say that so you'll feel sorry for me, but to say that um, it's important that you read those things. You'll hear it in my same conversational voice, and it's essential in order for you to do these assignments well. So you've got some writing to do before the end of this week. Um, you are going to analyze how Linfor builds a persuasive argument by appealing to underlying assumptions or using rhetorical strategies. I would recommend that for this article that you focus on rhetorical strategies. Um, I think that it'll be an easier practice exercise. It's only worth five points and it is practice. And anything you write, you can revise for the last essay of the semester. Um, we'll do a lot of revision this semester. In the discussion board, you're gonna tell your own literacy story. There's a prompt on the discussion board. And of course, you're gonna comment on it to a comment on at least three other students' posts, and then reflect on your own learning. Um, stories are powerful. Um, let me minimize this. Stories are super, super powerful. And um, here is a quote from Harriet McBride Johnson. Storytelling itself is an activity, it's not an object. Stories are the closest we come to a shared experience. We were not in the room with Kelly Lynn for learning about the Hillside Strangler while waiting to watch the Muppets. 
we were not with her mother, we were not with her grandmother. Um, and yet her storytelling shared it with us. And Kelly Linford does all the things that E. Shelley Reed recommends that we do. We see her experience, we see it through her eyes. Um, Johnson says that it gives us the ability to ride around in someone's head and be reminded that being who we are and where we are and doing what we're doing is not the only possibility. And I think that's a super profound idea. This is Gloria Anseldua. And she um, talks about stories also. She says, I write to record what others erase when I speak, to rewrite the stories others have miswritten about me and about you. It allows, it'll, storytelling allowed Ansel Dua to reshape what people assumed about her. So you're gonna write to let somebody else in on your story. So let somebody else ride around with you in your head or to clarify something that somebody might misunderstand. Your stories will be about literacy. So, and I want to expose you to multiple literacy narratives. Callie Linfor's story is a literacy narrative in that it shows something about how she acquired literacy. I have some other literacy narratives. Um, I have one by Gloria Anseldua. I have one by Harriet McBride Johnson. Um, I have some others um, and they're listed on the week two wrap up page. So you don't have to read them this week. But by next Wednesday, that's when we meet next, because Labor Day is Monday. Um, by next Wednesday, I would like you to have read two of those. Um, there are le the links are on the wrap week two wrap up page. If you finish early and you want to get a jump on that, um, and as you read, think about literacy uh, as you read the thing. The slide's kind of messed up. As you read, think about how you want to write about literacy um, in the first project that we're doing. And the prompt is on um, this week's module. So um, I'm done. So do any of you have questions for me before we all sign off? All right, then. Happy weekend, happy Labor Day, and um, happy second week of the semester. Thank you. I have a all. quick question, if yeah. possible. Um, you said on the the um, the writing assignment that's coming up for Thursday, uh, either rhetorical strategies or assumptions on writing. Is it possible that we do a mix of the two? Um, whenever I'm writing about underlying assumptions, or whenever I'm writing about a rhetorical strategy. I'm writing about how the audience is going to respond to that. So I'm automatically including some references to underlying assumptions. So you'll see that in the example that I put on Canvas. Yeah. So the answer is yes, Derek. Good question. The same thing. I saw you want us to read the prompt for the personal essays. Did you want us to like start working on it this nope. week? Okay. I'd like you to see some other literacy narratives first. Um, when I'm in a class, I like, by the way, it's 1152. If you need to sign off, go ahead. I don't count that against you at all, but I do want to like open it up for questions. Um, whenever I'm in a classroom, Kristen, I like to know what I'm doing in advance, if possible because it informs the way I might do my readings. And so by knowing where you're headed, um, I think that will help you as you read these other literacy narratives. I think I have about six of them listed and I'd like you to read two of them. You can read them all if you want, but that's an awful lot of time. So. 
Other questions? Okay. Thank you so much um, for all your participation. I know this is weird, um, but we're all making the best of it. And I really appreciate how you're engaging in the discussion. So have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.